yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Hello and welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting, where being rude is never acceptable, but sarcasm is welcome and swearing isn't always a bad option. Let's get started. Welcome to Jen Taylor Rerouting. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Carolina Vasilica. How are you? I am well. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm super excited about this. And uh, you told me before you got on that um, internet was a little spotty and you're at your in-laws. Tell me where you're from. So I'm born and raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, where it is the heart of our country, right in the middle, right in the middle of our country. So I'm born and raised there. I did for a while end up in Edmonton, Alberta, and I actually graduated high school there. And then I came back to Winnipeg to attend university. So I live in Winnipeg and my partner and I live in Winnipeg, but his parents and he grew up in Shoal Lake, Manitoba, which is just a little town of 800 people close to the border of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So yeah, the Wi-Fi phenomenon hasn't quite trickled its way <laughs> out to the town of 800 people, but, um, but we'll make it work. Yeah, absolutely we will. I have your website up and it's a beautiful site. Thank you. It, it's called the way I see it dot com, but it's spelt not um, it's I C I T, which I love. And tell me all about the way I see it, because I love the play on I love that play on words. Thank you. Yeah, actually the the episode that I just published today kind of explains a little bit of why, why I chose the way I see it. I have a podcast myself and I thought it was clever to use my first initial in the name. And I thought it gave me, because I've had a very diverse life and I thought it gave me the opportunity to talk a lot about a lot of different topics with people. So from my stories to my experiences, to the way I view things, to my opinions on certain matters, whether they're political, arts, whatever. Um, I thought it was a great way to kind of encompass all of that, or at least give me the opportunity to encompass all that instead of kind of pigeonholing myself into one thing. So I thought the way I see it was, yeah, just a really clever way for me to kind of umbrella everything I want to put out into the world and to share my experiences and the way that I view certain situations. I love it. And I, I like to go deeper than what the information that we can find online, but I love some of the stuff you're saying online. So the dichotomy of your personality. So yeah. like the, the lone wolf, the spiritual person, the left brain, but believing in energy. And yeah. so you're very, and you're four facial characters I'm like oh I would love to be that combination <laughs> you know so people people need to go on your about page on your website which is in the show notes and look at that because you're, you'd be like yes yes I want to be that um, <laughs> so it's really fun I just like it's very raw and authentic and tell me what your goal is with your website you have is a podcast yes so what's the basis of the podcast? How can people be on? Do you interview people? I do interview people. So the reason why I started the podcast, and we'll kind of discuss the different branches I want to come from the podcast, but the reason why I wanted to start the podcast was because I wanted to connect with people. My whole life, people have always told me that, you know, I was different and, and I inspired people to be their authentic self and to be honest and be genuine. And I looked around at society and I was like, what's missing here? Like, why are people so depressed? Why are people so lonely? Why are people so unhappy with the lives that they're living? And obviously I'm generalizing. I know that there are people who are happy, et cetera. I mean, I'm one of them. So I know there are other people who are happy with their circumstances. But I really sat down and I started to kind of break it down and I'm a bluntly honest person. Like I tell it like I see it, you know, I call it like it is. I will tell you what you need to hear, whether you want to hear it or not, you know? So I'm, I'm known as the blunt and honest 
friend in, in our group, in our friend group. And so I felt like that was kind of my first pillar of, of the podcast was, was truth. And then like, we'll get into my backstory. I've gone through a lot of traumatic experiences, but when people meet me today and then they hear my story, they're like, Oh my gosh, I would have never imagined you went through all of these things because you're such a happy go lucky, optimistic person. And like anytime somebody comes to you with a problem or advice or anything, you always manage to find the learning experience or the silver lining, or like you look at the world optimistically. So that just naturally became the second pillar of the podcast. And then a lesson that I've learned from my mid to late twenties is it's really important to be vulnerable. And that's how you make true connections with people is, is showing that vulnerability. Like when I was in my early twenties, I was very, you know, robust and, and combative and I just needed to be right. And I needed to, you know, it was like me against the world. I had this huge chip on my shoulder and like I had something to prove and I was very antagonizing and mouthy and had an attitude for days because I was scared to show people that I really am just this bleeding heart you know I wear my heart on my sleeve like I am so full of love and compassion and empathy but I thought those characteristics were signs of weakness mm -hmm. what I'm learning now is those are what truly make me strong those characteristics are what got me through all of the experiences that I got through and they're what are a they're they're what make me able to have really deep meaningful friendships and relationships with people so then that became the third pillar of the podcast so now my podcast's goal is to create a community where truth optimism and vulnerability are key because I truly believe that our disconnect in society it stems from our distance from those three pillars. And I think if we can start to own our truths, start, stop looking at circumstances and situations negatively and start being vulnerable about our true feelings, I truly believe we will start to reconnect with people and we will fulfill our lives and we will create deep, meaningful connections with people. I love this. And it's easy for people to connect with you. I mean, the page, the website is super easy to navigate. So that will be easy if people would like to um, connect with you. Is that the easiest way? Let's just talk about that right now. I'm all over Instagram. So like I'm okay. on Instagram probably 95% of my days. So yeah, Instagram is probably the easiest way to reach me, but there is a connect page on my website and that comes directly to my email. So that works as well. I check my email two to three times a day. So that is a, an opportunity to connect with me as well. But yeah, Instagram is kind of my be all and end all. <laughs> it's my favorite because it's mine. Yeah, Instagram, I love it. I love it. Everything on there I love. It's not social media e. There's nothing I'm pushing business wise. It's just people that I like to see. Yeah. I love it. So I agree with you there. So let's go back. Tell me when you were born. We know it was Manitoba. So were you the only child? Let's talk about your story. Sure. Yeah. So I'm the only child from my parents, which thank the universe for that. Um, <laughs> they should not have had more children together, which thankfully they didn't. I was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba. My mom is Chilean. My dad is Romanian. So I'm first generation Canadian. But I do have two brothers on my mom's side, two half brothers on my mom's side and two half brothers on my dad's side. Wow. Okay. So what year were you born and was your dad part of the picture when you were growing up? I was born in 1990 okay. and my dad wasn't really a part of my life growing up, but not by his choice. My mom used me almost as collateral damage to him and kind of like took him to the courts. And at that point in time, mothers usually always got custody even even if the father situation was better. That's just the way the system worked at that time. And so I only got to see my dad every second weekend growing up. 
and then my mom and I, my mom moved us to Edmonton, Alberta when I was 12. So growing up in my really childhood years, I only got to see my dad every, every second weekend. And then going through my teenage years, I saw him maybe once a year. So my dad and I are almost strangers to each other, but not by choice. We just didn't have the opportunity to create a connection and like a relationship together and there's obviously still love there because he is my dad and obviously I'm his daughter but by the time we had the opportunity to create a relationship I was already a grown woman and it's just how do you go back to that you know I'm not a little girl anymore so you don't really do you you don't go back but you try to I guess carve something unique it's I I get where you're coming from it's sort of awkward so you're born in 1990, Manitoba. Tell so you're, and I wanted to clarify your dad because from your the information I had, I wasn't sure what what role he played. So yeah. let's talk about growing up and your mom. And how old were you when those two half brothers were born? Because your dad's side, you weren't as involved with, but your mom, you were. Yeah. So my first half brother was born when I was 16. So oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So I, for the most part, grew up as an only child. And then I actually moved out when I was 16. So I only lived with my half brother for a few months. Yeah. And then I, my mom and I have had a very on again, off, uh, on again, off again relationship right now being off for the last five years. But yeah, so my first, my first half brother was born when I was 16. And then they've, They've come every two years since, I think. So one is, I mean, I'm 28 now. So one is 12, one is 10, one is eight. And then I believe the youngest one is six, I think. And you don't have much contact with the the boys. Okay. Well, at 16, so you did mention that you moved out on your own when you were 16. So let's go back. That first 16 years, you're an only child with your mom, who I know is using you as collateral with dad. Tell me, let's go, let's dig deep on this, on uh, what it was like with your mom and kind of your history. Take me through that whole story. Yeah, so my mom is is a beautiful, a beautiful woman, but she she had a ch- both of my parents had really tough childhoods. Like my dad escaped communist Romania and my mom escaped assassination attempts in Chile because her dad was kind of a higher a higher up person leading a resistance. So they both had really rough childhoods. And I know they tried to do better with me, but not great. (laughs) So my mom actually had me when I was 19 years, when she was 19 years old, which I mean, I'm the least judgmental person you'll ever meet. If you had children at that age or younger, and that worked for you, amazing for me personally. And just seeing my mom's experience, that was too young for her because we essentially grew up like siblings. And in a lot of circumstances, I ended up having to be the more bigger person and kind of the parent in the situation. So I grew up really quickly And my mom also battles a lot of mental health. So my mom is bipolar and she also has obsessive compulsive disorder, which she very graciously um, passed on to me. I also have been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. The difference, however, is that I have done extensive research lately into mental health and really trying to become self-aware and try to help my situation. And I, I feel like it really has helped Whereas she, and maybe it was just at the time, you know, how society was, mental health wasn't really a huge topic back then, but she chose to do nothing about it. In fact, she just tried to pretend like it wasn't, it wasn't a factor in her situation. So growing up, it was, it was tough, you know, and whenever I share my story about my mother, I always try to put forth that, you know, yes, I had a a tough upbringing and yes, she was, she was hard and she was cruel. And, you know, she beat me and would throw me into the stairs and would, you know, 
tell me that I was a mistake constantly, that I was never wanted. The only reason why I existed was because my dad forced her into keeping me to term, you know, like this, these are the things that I, I grew up hearing. But I also just want to preface and say that my childhood wasn't all bad, you know, like we did have, you know, she loved me with what she could. And she had this alter ego called Funny Mummy, which was this funny voice. And like, I do have happy memories together. But as I grew older and grew older, those happy memories started to get farther and farther apart. And then it just got to the point where I had to put my mental health above all else and my well being above all else. And although she gave me life, my life is still my own. And I think that's a really important message for, for children and for parents to recognize that just because you give birth to someone, it doesn't mean that their life belongs to you. They, they have autonomy. They are their own person. You know, their life is theirs to do what they want with it. So yeah, like growing up, my mom and I, we're like best friends who fought a lot, but we were like best friends. Like when I look at the Gilmore girls, that's kind of what we were like because she was so young. And like, I remember her getting her GED, you know, like I'm 28 years old now. And I remember when my mom was 28 years old because I was seven or eight years old, you know, memories were already forming at that time, which is crazy to me to think like, if I had a seven or eight year old right now, what, that's crazy. And so, yeah, we, we grew up like best friends, but she had her own demons. Like I said, like becoming more self-aware about my mental health, it, it allows me to be more compassionate and, and give her a little more grace that she wasn't always in control of her mind and her body. And I remember this one time she hit me across the face and instantly I could see the the pain in her eyes and right away she started apologizing and like I'm so sorry I'm so sorry and and I could see that she was hurting so I I kind of put my physical pain aside to comfort her and just be like it's okay like it didn't hurt that much you know because I could see that I didn't know what it was at the time because that was just my reality. And obviously I wasn't educated on mental health when I was a kid, but now replaying those memories in my head and seeing them, you know, she, she wasn't in control and, and she didn't do anything to try and gain that control. So yeah, I had a, I had a very tough childhood, but not as tough as my parents, as my parents did. I still had a lot of, good memories and and yeah they kind of made me who I am today I guess so it's, it's amazing that you offered that much grace in a situation that was pretty traumatic and you did it at a young age so growing up fast is kind of an understatement there were other things that happened when you were growing up also though that yeah. I and I want to ask or I want you to as part of the story like how did that happen and who are they and did your mom know did you tell anyone did any okay so dive because mom that's a bit that's a big one and I appreciate that you're so gracious about who she was and her upbringing I don't think a lot of people ever gain that clarity yeah so that's very impressive but so let's let's dive back to when you were about eight yeah. Go into all of that. So from the ages of eight to 14, I was sexually assaulted by four different family members. And the first one was my grandfather on my mom's side. So, and I'm not going to tell my mom's stories because those are her own. I, I can only, I'm only comfortable sharing mine, but that can kind of give you a glimpse of, of her own demons. So yeah, my my grandfather sexually assaulted me from eight to ten. And I have an episode of this actually on my podcast. I believe it's episode number eight, if you really want to hear a more in-depth um, story of it. But 
it went on for about two years until I started to get to the point, you know, from, from eight, you're very, you know, adults, adults know everything. Adults are, are what's right and wrong. Like adults lead the way and you trust adults. And if this is what adults are telling you, then okay. Even though something, something doesn't feel right, but you're just a kid. What do you know? But then when you start to get to more 10 years old, now you're kind of like, mm, no, this still doesn't feel right. And so it started to get to the point where I would avoid going to my grandfather's house or, or if we were there and we were saying goodbye, like I didn't want him touching me. I was very, very obvious about that. And my parents just thought I was being a bratty kid, you know, who just like didn't want, didn't want to be around her grandfather or whatever. And then because I was avoiding going to his house, he had to become more creative in ways where he could see me. So he would start showing up at our house. And I remember this one time, my mom asked me to go grab something from upstairs and he followed me upstairs and on my mom's bed would pin me down and tried to, he called it the vampire game. So like I said, in the episode, it kind of goes through how it progressed. And um, so, yeah, he called it the vampire game and, and he was the vampire and I was his victim, which is so sickly poetic now. <laughs> you know, you just kind of have to, you just kind of have to laugh at it, at, at the ridiculousness of it. So, and then it got to the point where my mom started like really paying attention. And I remember we came home one day. And I was very upset about having to hug my grandfather goodbye from leaving his house. And I was sitting in bed and my mom came into my room and she said, like, can I ask you something? And I said, yeah, of course. And she said, has your abuelo, um, Hispanic, so abuelo means grand grandfather in, in Spanish. She said, she said, has your abuelo ever touched you inappropriately? And I started crying and I started apologizing because I felt like it was my fault. Like I had brought this onto myself and I said, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't mean to, you know, and she started crying and she said, I know Mijita, like, it's okay. I believe you. And that hearing, I believe you is so important it's so unbelievably important and from then we we went through the courts and we and a lot of it I've blocked out of my memory honestly but I remember having to take these dolls and like show show what he did with me using these dolls and I remember sitting in the in the courtroom and him watching me watching like I remember him sitting there watching me and just feeling so uncomfortable and it's funny because I don't even I, I didn't even know what what the outcome of it was I for years I had no idea if he was convicted I every few years I would pull up the court registry to try to to read what it would say but it's all in this law lingo and I, I don't have a law background so I didn't know it was happening and when I when I published this episode on my podcast I had uh, a girl because I was in a sorority in university well I'm still in a sorority but I'm an alumni now and a girl in another sorority is in law school and she messaged me and was like hey I don't want to cross any lines here but if you want me to take a look at that court registry and and translate anything for you I'd be more than happy to do that so I was like oh my god yes please so I sent it to her and he was he was convicted which um I, when she told me that, I, I started crying, and I was like, honestly, I'm, I'm crying tears of relief because for the last 20 years, I guess 18 years since since I went through all that, I had no idea if it was for anything. You know, I don't know. I didn't know if he had gotten away with it. Like, I didn't know anything, but now I know that for the rest of his life, that's going to be on his record, and that may, made it worth it, so... Yeah, so what an amazing first... thing that you were in court in front of him. I think they do things differently now because they do. Yeah, they God, have how like awful. dogs, but yeah. Oh really. my gosh, I can't even imagine what that took. So 
holy cow good for you i'm proud of you thank you <laughs> so yeah that was that was the first instance and then there were two two individual cert, like situations with two uncles that honestly aren't really worth repeating to me because they were just like a one a one off thing whereas my grandfather was a repetitive for years whereas the other two were just kind of one offs and then the last one was actually an uncle through marriage and so yeah like no actual family family her relation to me other than a piece of paper but that went on for probably a year i think yeah a year and um they always like to make it into a game i've realized so that if you know if anything ever comes out it's like oh well you asked to play this game yeah i asked to play a game i didn't ask you to touch me inappropriately <laughs> you know like there's a there's a distinction there there's a difference between playing a game and and welcoming you into my private areas so yeah, that went on until about 14. And then um, I think they moved actually, or or I just stopped going over or something. But yeah, it was it was in junior high. And yeah, so that was, uh, that was pretty interesting. So needless to say, when I got into adulthood, and I started having sexual intimacies with my partners, they were difficult, because I had a lot of this back but subconscious you know this is wrong because leading up to all of that all of my sexual experiences were wrong you know they were with with family members which which just it messes it messes you up it really messes you up so yeah that was uh that was kind of something else I went through in my childhood <laughs> did your mom know about the two uncles even though it was only a one incident she didn't know about that and then what about this uncle by marriage yeah so the the two instances I never told any uh, anyone about them because keeping in mind like I had only recently found out that my grandfather was convicted right. so all throughout all of this I didn't think speaking up did anything because I didn't know what the outcome was. So when the next two happened, I was like, well, what's the point? Nothing's going to come of it. So why, why bother making everyone else uncomfortable about this situation when, you know, like what good could come of speaking up? So that was kind of my mentality. And then with the uncle by marriage, um, I didn't say anything while it was happening. And then when they moved, then my mother asked me, and I couldn't tell you why, but she had asked me if anything had happened with him. And then at that point, when she had asked me, then I said, yeah, like this and this and this kind of happened. So. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> and I will also just say through all of this, I've never done any kind of drug. I don't drink alcohol. I don't you know, I never, I never self-medicated, which I think is something people also find incredibly shocking. Yes. I mean, you know, when I was raised and there was sexual abuse, so you can go in several different directions, right? You yeah. become super promiscuous. You can have a lot of baggage associated with sexuality, like you were talking about, which I think is super common. How can I love it and want it and enjoy myself if it's this big, horrible, bad thing that's naughty yeah. and someone did to me instead of you're doing together. So that's probably common. But it, I mean, self-medicating, certainly, which I never did either. And yeah. I could have. It was everywhere. But yeah. yeah, it's so what how did you deal with? First of all, I want to go back a little because through this whole thing, now your mom's being super supportive when she asks the question, but things happen for quite a long time before she asks the question. And I understand yeah. you can't place the blame on the child for not telling. No. So in, in the meantime, though, back at the ranch, meanwhile, you know, she's still telling you you're a mistake. She's having bipolar episodes. She's abusive physically. I mean, holy cow. How, what are you doing to cope? What's going on in school? What about your friends? 
Are you talking to anyone? What did you do to cope? Honestly, I, I wish I had a better answer for this, but at the time, it was just my reality. You know, it wasn't until I became an adult and I started looking at all my functioning friends and their functioning families that I was like, oh, this isn't normal <laughs> to go through all of this. Not everybody does this. And don't get me wrong. I, I do know that there are people who do have certain similar situations as I do. I'm not saying I'm special by any means. I'm just here trying to talk about it and create a dialogue. Yeah. But yeah, growing up, it was just kind of like, that was my reality. So I didn't really have anything to compare it to. So I just kind of went on day to day. I will say though, that in my youth, I was able to disconnect very quickly, which I think was a survival tactic. And then once I started to get into my adult years, I still kind of had that, but it was becoming detrimental to my relationships. Whereas in my youth, it was a survival tactic. But when I started to get older, it, the, the tables kind of turned and it was preventing me from creating really deep, true connections with other people. And music. I, music was, music was my, my everything. It was my saving grace. It helped me filter out what I was feeling. I was so disconnected from my emotions. I was like, I don't know, am I angry? Am I sad? Like, what am I feeling? So I would put music on and music would kind of take me through this emotional journey and help me figure out what I was feeling. But then at the same time, my mom is a musician. My mom has a beautiful singing voice. She's very creative. She can make a feast out of nothing in the kitchen. You know, she has designing, she has designing talents, you know, creating different outfits. She's a beautiful singer. She's a stunning woman physically. She's just beautiful and uh, crazy as a shit storm though. Like, <laughs> you know, just, you know, that, that, uh, that graph where it's like you have to you know the hotter a girl is the crazier she is like my mom my mom is at the top there but it's all like I said we kind of grew up as siblings and it's almost like she had this jealousy factor and like anytime I tried to do something anytime I tried to sing she technically had the power in the house so she would tell me to shut up and that I wasn't any good and that I didn't know how to sing so I should just shut up and I was like, okay. And now people tell me like, oh my God, you have such a beautiful singing voice. And I'm like, really? Because I hate it. You know, like I love singing. Don't get me wrong. But I hate the sound of my own voice because I've just been programmed for so long to think that it wasn't good. So, yeah, I kind of went off a tangent there. Did it? I love the tangents. <laughs> yeah. I love the tangents. So there weren't, you didn't have a best friend growing up or uh, somebody you could confide in. Uh, anything athletic? How I were mean, you? In I school? played. I I was very. I got was very heavily involved in school. I was voted in as president of my school. I I sang for assemblies at my school. I was very heavily involved in school. I didn't have a whole lot of friends because you know books were my friends. I was a huge bookworm. Um, like I, I said in my about me page, I was kind of a lone wolf, like in between classes, I would put music on with my big headphones and just kind of walk to class, walk class to class. But I was very well known in my high school. Like I was, I was this popular lone wolf, which just came naturally because I do have a very outgoing personality. You know, I don't really have a shy bone in my body. You know, I can talk to a tree if I want to, <laughs> you know, I think I've so, done that before actually. Yeah. Really well. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I it, like I said, it was this weird dichotomy where I was very popular and well known in school, but I never went to any parties. You know, I worked two part time jobs while I went to school. I maintained honor roll when I was in school. You know, I and then anytime I was home, I was in my room reading or listening to music. So, I want you to jump in and tell me because we were kind of at that point. Um, and you mentioned it earlier that you moved out on your own when you were 16 and yeah. you, you did get through high school. You did have two part-time jobs and you did graduate with honors. So how did that moving out at 16 occur? 
why did you decide like what most 16 year olds don't think of it's not even in the radar. <laughs> and I want to make a clarifying point that, like you said, as a kid, this was what you knew. Even if you know that it's not right or something's off, you haven't figured out until you're older that other people's lives weren't anything like yours and how dysfunctional it was. Yeah. So for you to kind of emancipate at 16 to me is a pretty big deal. So I, can you jump in and discuss that with us? Yeah, so like I said, my mom my mom suffers from mental illness and I I was a pre-calculus tutor in 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 high school and I was going to write my pre-calculus exam, but I left a little bit early to go to one of my jobs. I worked at Baskin Robbins, which is an ice cream shop in in our little neighborhood mall there. So I left a bit, little bit early to go stop at Baskin Robbins to grab my check before I went to go write my exam. And as I was leaving the mall, my phone started ringing and it was my mom. So I answered it and she just lost her shit. Like she lost her mind and was like, what do you think you're doing? You think you can just leave the house whenever you want to like, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, I literally came to grab my check from work and then I'm going to school to write a final exam. Like what, what's the issue here? And, but in hindsight, mental illness isn't always logical, right? So this I know now, but at the time I was just kind of like, why are you acting like a crazy person? I'm not binge drinking in the middle of the day. I'm not running off with my friends to snort cocaine or whatever high school students are doing. You know, I'm like, I'm literally coming to get money that I worked for and then going to write an exam that I also worked for, <laughs> you know, like, so yeah, she just lost her mind and, and said, like, if I didn't like the rules under her roof, then I should leave. And I was like, cool, this was an awesome conversation to have before going to write pre-cal, you know? And uh, so I actually had did have a very close friend of mine at the time. And so I called her and I was like, I think my mom just kicked me out. And so she said, well, come live with with my sister and I. So I went, wrote my exam, which I passed by the way. Yay. And, uh, <laughs> and I went home and I started packing up my stuff. And my mom was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, you told me to leave. What do you think I'm doing? I'm packing up my stuff. She's like, you're not going anywhere. And I said, oh yes, I am. Like I refuse to have my home held over my head like that. You know, like that's, that's no way to live, to, to be worried that where you're living or where you're sleeping at night could just instantly be taken away from you just because somebody feels like it. I was like, I refuse to live in those circumstances. So I started packing up my stuff and it just became this huge drama. She wouldn't let anybody into the house to come help me move anything. She called the police and the police told her she's 16. She can legally leave if she wants to. She just can only take things that she's bought for herself. And at that time, I was working two part-time jobs. I bought everything for myself anyways. You know, my, my mom was on welfare. You know, I grew up in, in Manitoba housing. Like, I didn't have, you know, everything. My dad is the opposite extreme where he came to from Romania, started scrubbing toilets and now owns like a multi-million dollar healthcare company. So I lived, I lived both extremes where I had nothing and I had everything. So because I had nothing, I know how to appreciate everything. But yeah, at that time I didn't have a dresser. I didn't have a, a vanity or anything. I slept on an air mattress on the floor. I got ready on the floor with just a mirror leaning up against the wall and I had a stereo in my room. That was it. That was all I had in my room. Everything else was like clothes and makeup and shoes and like stuff that I'd bought for myself. So I was like, no, like I'm leaving. And so I packed two garbage bags full of, full of clothes, full of my stuff. And I, I walked out the door. Wow. Now in the meantime, I know that you, put yourself through university working full-time and part-time and you went to school full-time mm -hmm. where did the the and I know you've had relationships but there was one in particular that was 
pretty chaotic. When did that happen between high school? We're talking 16 and then college. What, where was this relationship? Was it the, my, well, I think it was my high school one. Cause I kind okay. of had two, two really toxic relationships. One okay. was in early university and one was when I was in high school. Okay. And so, um, so when I moved out at 16, I lived with my, my friend at the time and her older sister. And then I, and I also had a boyfriend at the time okay. who was lovely. His, his, he's lovely. His parents are lovely. Like his family was lovely. But here's the thing, people do shitty things and people, like people can do bad things, but it doesn't make them shitty people. And I really firmly believe that. And so sometimes I have a, a hard time telling my stories and my experiences because I'm worried about painting this really negative light on these people who do have really amazing qualities to them. So I just want to preface with that. But um, my boyfriend at the time, his family started to notice that I was becoming really malnourished. You know, I was, I'm, I'm 112 pounds. I'm five, five, like I'm already a tiny person as it is, but just the stress of, of living on my own, having to up my hours at my two jobs to try and make ends meet, still trying to make sure that I get my high school diploma you know, I could barely afford to eat. So I was so thankful that my second job was at a restaurant. And so if I couldn't afford to eat anything that week, we got white rice for free. And so if I, if I have anything to eat, I would just eat white rice at this restaurant. But uh, I don't know if you know, white rice, not super nutritional. <laughs> So, so my tiny little frame started to get even tinier and my boyfriend's parents were like, okay, no, like you need to come live with us. So we, I, I moved in with my boyfriend and his family for a little bit and then we graduated high school. So then we got our, our own apartment and that's kind of where the tables turned. I don't know if it was like the stress was a trigger for him or something, but he worked in construction in Alberta, which at that at that time, this is 2008 now, was was or before before the crash, was um, really hopping. So, and I got a job at an office as like an administrative coordinator, and he was making twice as much money as I was. But for some reason, whenever the bills started to come around, I was paying for everything. So, and I, so I was 18, I was making $28,000 a year at the time, which for an 18 year old is pretty decent, mm -hmm. but an 18 year old supporting herself and her boyfriend, it, it was tough. Yeah. And it didn't make sense to me how he made twice the amount of money I did, but I was paying for everything. And then I started to know, notice in my bank account, hundred dollar increments going missing. And I was just kind of like, I was like, am I losing my mind? Like, when, when did I take out this hundred dollars? What did I use that for? And then it ended up being, long story short, that he was a cocaine addict. And he was constantly, that's where all his money was going. And then he started taking my money to also fund his cocaine <laughs> addiction. And like I said, I've never, I've never done drugs before, but they change a person. And I, I can say that from, from witnessing it firsthand, not experiencing it myself, but I witnessing it in him, like it changes a person. And at that time, like I said, like from eight to 14, I was, I was sexually assaulted. So like, I didn't know you could say no. And it was interesting because in Alberta, you have to take this one course to graduate high school called COM, and it's career and life management. So they teach how to build a budget and how to write a resume and a cover letter and all of that stuff. Yeah, honestly, that's it's a really, awesome. No, it is. It, it truly is. Like when I, when I came back to Manitoba and so many of my friends didn't know, you know, how to save or what an RRSP was or anything, I was kind of flabbergasted that that I feel like that course should be mandatory across the world, honestly, but I digress. And, um, 
Yeah, so so he's, he's taking money. You've had this class where you know yeah. how to budget and stuff. Yeah, and in this class, we also got taught about sexual consent, ah, which, there you go. which wasn't a huge, a huge thing back then either. And so when our teacher told us that just because you're in a relationship doesn't mean you're obligated to have sex with your partner or that your body somehow no longer belongs to you, I started to feel like crap because I started to notice that I was being forced into non-consensual sex with my boyfriend at the time constantly. And like where there were times where I would be crying during it because I would just want him to stop. And I would say like, please stop. I don't want to do this anymore. And he would just say like, let me finish, let me finish. And so that, that was a constant in our relationship. And like it, it took me a really long time to recognize that like you, you, you own your body. Nobody else owns your body. You, just because you're in a relationship with someone doesn't mean you owe them anything. If you don't feel like having sex that night, you shouldn't have to. And so, yeah, this was a regular occurrence, which just, again, added on top of my already confusing thoughts on, on sexual yeah. intimacy. And so then it got to the point where now he's, he's snorting cocaine and, and non-consensual sex. And then at one point he, he tried to like lock me in our bedroom and I had to, it sounds so dramatic saying it, but I don't know how else to say it. Like I had to escape my apartment. And so I told him that I needed to use the washroom and the way it was, was like the bedroom came out this way and then slightly to the right was was the bathroom and then down the hall to the left was the door to get out of the apartment so i told him i needed to go to the bathroom so he let he let me out of the room and was like leading the way to the bathroom and i like pushed him into the bathroom and ran out the door i wasn't even wearing shoes you know i just ran out into the middle of the street not wearing shoes and I was pretty much homeless for a month, you know, like I, I couch surfed on, on co-workers couches and stuff, but I had nowhere I called home. And eventually I had people come with me. I had these two Nova Scotian huge guys come with me to the apartment to help me get all my stuff. And then I ended up renting a room in this crazy cat lady's apartment. <laughs> oh man, she was such a character. And, uh, yeah, that, uh, that was kind of my toxic Holy relationship. Wow. There. I mean, when you go toxic, you go big, go big or go home, right? Yeah, why not? <laughs> You're like, I have a toxic relationship and, and Carolina goes, I can top that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful. So you, I, Mike, I was going to ask, did you go back and get your stuff and how, cause you have just the clothes on your back and nothing. Yeah. And you're working. And then you, were you already in university or did you enter after that you entered after no I took a year yeah I took a year off and I just I worked in that office I had mentioned earlier but it was a it was a dating service for for busy professionals so it was you know doctors lawyers you know people with master's degrees PhDs who didn't have the time to go out and and romantically network themselves so then we would match them with other highly educated people. So I was this 18 year old with a high school diploma surrounded by doctors and lawyers and well-traveled people and people with all these like really impressive degrees. And I kind of looked around and I was like, I want more. Like I need more for myself. I don't want to just be a high school graduate. Not that the, there's anything wrong with that. I know a lot of successful people who only have high school diplomas. I wanted more for me, especially I'm the first person in my family to go to post-secondary education, never mind get a degree in its entirety. So I wanted that for myself. So yeah, I took a year off and then, and then when I was 19, I came back to Winnipeg because I felt like I had a bigger support system here just with like kids I grew up with and stuff. So um, yeah, then I came back and when I was 19, I, I went to university. What did you graduate with? What was your degree? 
economics and business management. Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> You're that kid that's smart in school. Yeah. <laughs> So, because just through discussion, I wouldn't be like, I'm going to peg her with a type A degree. <laughs> but here we are. It's that dichotomy yeah. again of personality. Yeah. So you're in Manitoba. You you put yourself through university, first person to get your degree, which is amazing. And then, now you're married. I were, no, we're dating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. You said in-laws. I yeah, did. it's. <laughs> I've been with the same person for years and we're not married. So it's yeah. all good for me. So you're with the same. Per okay. So I want to talk, I want you to transition me to, I want to know what you do for work and, or is that the podcast? Actually, I just recently left my nine to five job because I, I really want to put all my efforts into this podcast and those branches that I, I had mentioned at the very beginning. So right now I'm just kind of, unemployed slash self-employed that's my favorite that's what i am <laughs> for two years i mean yeah. I, welcome to the club <laughs> you yeah. won't make a lot but the warm fuzzy feeling is really amazing and that's yeah true. yeah um so you're you've segued into doing this full-time which is awesome um it's interesting though that's why i ask because it's another dichotomy in your personality that yeah. you uh, are this really warm person extrovert who has a type a job who quit that type a job to do the warm and fuzzy <laughs> i mean yeah. it's really it's really interesting and very cool because you're very multifaceted so i love it so what i would like to kind of wrap up with is getting into a healthy relationship and learning how healthy sexuality because for me and for I know a lot of other people, when you go through some of those disastrous situations, um, date rape, molestation, sexual abuse, a lot of us really love sex. We just don't know how to yeah. navigate it, right? And, yeah. and, and like not screw ourselves over in our heads. So can you, can you finish off on a high note and tell me about that a little bit? Yeah, so I... Like you mentioned earlier, some people go kind of the promiscuous route, and I did I did that in, in my early 20s. You know, I was always a relationship hopper, but anytime I wasn't in a relationship, I was just kind of like person, person, person. And, but then once I got into a relationship, I really struggled. Like, I could either have sex with someone, or I could love someone. I couldn't do both at the same time, which makes sense, because my early sexual experiences were with family members whom you typically love, you know, you typically love those family members. And then to have that wrong feeling at the same time, that's the only way you can really cope is to separate the two. So once I started to get into my adulthood and I started to have sexual intimacies with people, I didn't know how to kind of bring those two back together. And the, act the partner that I had before my current boyfriend, I truly believe he saved me from myself. And I say that because I was not in touch with my mental illness at the time. I was not in touch with my, my sexual intimacy issues at the time. I just felt like I was this crazy person who didn't deserve to be loved, who thought she was just this hot mess that was never going to, to be happy and never feel fulfilled or anything, who just essentially thought she was worthless. And so I started dating this guy in university and his parents have been together for 30 years. You know, he's never seen them fight. He just like had the complete opposite of, of my upbringing. Like he was just this really stable person. And so anytime I would kind of like fly off the handle and break up with him and storm out the house, he was just kind of like, Carolina, this isn't normal. You know, this is not how you function in a relationship. Like just because we have a disagreement doesn't mean we have to break up every disagreement. Like that's crazy. But that's how my parents worked growing up. So again, that's what I thought was normal, right? So yeah, and then and then I got to the point where he he did a number on me. Like he truly saved me from myself. But it got to the point where I was starting to outgrow the relationship and I started to feel like he was like I didn't need him anymore. And so he 
kind of resented that a little bit and would try to treat me like I was still the person I was at the beginning. And like, if I did try to have just like a calm conversation with him about something, he would flip it around and just be like, why are you acting crazy again? And I was just kind of like, I'm not, I'm, I'm just trying to have a conversation with you. And you just very obviously don't want to take any blame <laughs> at this point. So so we separated, we, we went our separate ways, but then I, I, I went to therapy and I was just kind of like, you know what? I, like, I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. You know, that's, that's kind of the way I thought my life was going to go. And when that ended, it kind of rocked me. So I was like, I don't want to get into another relationship and have it not work out again. And I mean, there's obviously no guarantee, but I wanted to do everything I could to work on myself yeah. to try to get as close as I could to that guarantee. So I went to therapy and she really helped me. So I was, I was diagnosed with OCD when I was like 19, 20, but it went in year out the other and I just didn't pay attention to any of it at all. And, uh, and then I, when I went back to therapy, she really helped me navigate my OCD and just tell me like even if I have an OCD thought like it's okay but to not let it give that power and then she also helped me navigate my sexual intimacy issues and she told me that because I'm an adult now I recognize how wrong it was and I feel like I should have known better mm. because I have the insight that I have now she's like what you need to realize Carolina is that you were a child it wasn't up to you to know better at that point. It was up to the adults you trusted to know better at that point. Now you are one of those adults and you know better, but that responsibility, that onus wasn't on you when you were younger. So that really, like when she told me that, she was like, it's okay that it felt good when you were a kid. You're not in control of how your body reacts to physical stimulation. You know, like when a girl is raped and she orgasms and people are like, well, you orgasmed, you must have liked it. What? What is wrong with you? Sex isn't about how it ends, whether it ends on an orgasm or not. It, it's consent is how it starts and how it continues. And if it doesn't start with an enthusiastic yes and continue with an enthusiastic yes throughout it, that's not consent. And so she really helped me navigate that, like just because my body reacted, even though my mind was, was acting differently, that wasn't my fault either. So she's just a wonderful, wonderful person. And I, I still see her every, every few months just to kind of, anytime I start to feel like I'm kind of, you know, tipping a little this way or a little that way, I'll go check in with her for an hour and just balance myself again. And so now with my partner currently, he's a dream. Like, honestly, I did not know someone like him existed. He's like a unicorn. And it honestly, it makes me feel a little bit sad sometimes that I feel so lucky to be with someone like that, because I feel like that should be the norm. That should be the standard for everyone. Everyone should feel like they're with a unicorn. Everyone should feel safe and comfortable and loved and understood and We've been together for two years and he still always asks me for consent every single time. And not in like a super formal, like, milady, do I have your consent? <laughs> <laughs> it's not like that, but it's something like, do you want to? Like, are you into this? Like, is this okay? Like, can I do that? You know, there's always something and it still blows my mind how, how he gets it. He just gets it you know, and, and it's funny because before, you know, it was, like I said, I couldn't have sexual intimacy and love at the same time. So before it was like, I never really wanted to, whereas like, we don't really have that problem anymore. <laughs> uh, <yay! laughs> <You know? laughs> so, and, and it's, it's just crazy. Like, you know, you know, in the movies, when you see like really intimate, romantic, passionate scenes, and you're just like, it's not like that. Like, why are you giving people false hope? No, listen up, everyone. It is like that. It's possible. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> it's possible. 
<laughs> you can have the mind blowing sex and the mind blowing love at the same time. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're all high fiving over here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great note to end on, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so you can, tell me. Oh wait, tell me your Instagram. How can people find you on Instagram? Yes. Yeah, so my Instagram is at Miss Lena V. So M I S S L I N A V E E at Miss Lena V. Wouldn't have found you. Okay. No. <laughs> and then your website is the way I see it. And you do have contact. There's two options to contact you through the website or through Instagram. Yeah. And thank you so much for sharing your crazy fun journey. Fun thank retrospectively, you, you know. Yeah. And uh, for, I, I love that you're doing things to uplift other people that have gone through the same thing. Well, the thing is, you know, it might sound crazy and people might be shaking their head when I say this, like what, but like, I wouldn't change anything my whole life. I wouldn't change any of it as, as hard as it was. And as much as it messed me up momentarily, I am who I am because of those experiences. And th those experiences, like you just said, helped me help other people. And so when my friends started coming to me with their own sexual assault stories, I was better prepared to help them navigate that and help them deal with it because I had to go through mine at such a young age. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, like I, I wouldn't change anything I'd gone through because like I, I'm a self-proclaimed eternal optimist. And that's not to say that I think life is sunshine and rainbows all the time, because I know that it's not, I've lived the dark and cloudy weather. Yes. But an eternal optimist knows that even if it's hard right now, it will get better. And my mantra is positive outcomes only. And that's to say that just because you go through an obstacle on your journey doesn't mean you still can't end at a positive outcome at the end of it. And you keep going and you keep fighting and you, you have that resilience and that strength until you get that positive outcome. I totally agree. I always call it panning for gold. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you're just panning for gold. The silver lining is the same thing or finding the light moments within the dark because there's yeah. a lot of them if you're willing to recognize them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening in to Jen Taylor rerouting like share. And of course, comment. I welcome input with attitude. Get a copy of my book on Amazon. Hello, my name is Warrior Princess. Or check out my website, jentaylor.net. And if you still want more, sign up for one of my coaching packages.